and, so, mute, and mute my phone. Yes, and I'll ask everybody to please mute their microphones because I know that there are you know noises in the background. Uh, so please mute your microphones and when you you want to talk, just raise your hands. So um, welcome again. Uh, the order of the day is I'm going to invite Father Jerry Bonapane, uh, Bonapane to give the, the invocation. And, uh, and then after that, I will invite my dear colleague from the Department of Religion. We are both in the Department of Religion and Monsignor Cafon was uh, a member of the Department of Religion to, to say a few words about Monsignor Cafon. Then I will introduce our distinguished speaker that we have today. We'll have the lecture and then we'll open the floor for, uh, for question. Is this a good plan or not? <laughs> Okay, yes. then. Uh, please, Father Jerry. Oh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mirzaku, and good to be with all of you, my dear friends, and uh, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, almighty and loving God, we thank you for this special event, the sixth annual Monsignor James Cafone Memorial Lecture. How good to honor the legacy of a great and loving man and priest who gave his heart and soul to Seton Hall University. Well, Monsignor Cafone loved food, eating it and preparing it, especially for others. And his mouth would surely water at the title of this evening's presentation. I think we can easily picture Monsignor Cafone at a table in a piazza in Rome, enjoying a meal with friends, perhaps even the Pope, and a, and a delicious plate of pasta in front of him, and perhaps even a drop or two of the red sauce on his shirt, and with a big, beautiful smile that we so fondly remember. May our dear Monsignor Jim now partake of the heavenly banquet. Almighty God, bless our evening, bless our presenter, Luan Zerlo, and may Luan allow us even for a short while to escape from the trials and challenges of the present day and imagine ourselves in the eternal city of Rome and enjoy so much of what the city offers. Dear God, we thank you for the gift of food and for all your beautiful and generous creation. We ask for food in a world where many walk in hunger, for faith in a world where many walk in fear, for friends in a world where many walk alone. Yes, free us from the COVID pandemic, keep us all safe and well, we give you thanks for all your blessings, O God. And we pray all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And uh, St. Elizabeth Ann Bailey Seaton, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Jerry, for this beautiful invocation and connecting, you know, our dear Monsignor Cafon to, uh, to Mother Seaton that we are celebrating actually in this very special year of Mother Seton, the 200th anniversary of Mother Seton. Uh, I will invite now Professor um, uh, <coughs> Choi, the, the chair of the Department of, uh, of Religion, uh, to say a few words about our big man actually, who is Monsignor. Uh, Dr. Mirzaku, thank you so much um, for um, giving me this chance to say a few words about our dear friend and colleague, uh, Monsignor Cafone. Um, and I hope um, no one minds if I just refer to him as Jim here. And, um, you know, Father Jerry, um, you, you, you captured um, um, Jim um, beautifully in your, in your prayer. So um, I don't think I can, I can do better than that. But, um, but I just wanted to um, spend a minute or, or so just um, saying a few things about Jim. Um, I was trying to jot down all the things that I wanted to say, but um, 
it started to become um, multiple pages and I didn't think Dr. Murzaku wanted me to go on and on. Um, <laughs> so she's giving me the signal um, not to go on and on, but just real quickly, um, you know, um, for those of you at least who did not know um, Jim Caffone, Monsignor Caffone, um, he was a man who um, had very strong opinions and he had very strong opinions about our curriculum, about the kinds of courses that we should teach, about um, what we should be doing with ourselves um, on a regular basis. And he, he had these strong opinions, not because, and, and he was more than, more than happy to share his, his opinions um, with others, not because he was interested in um, simply um, bringing attention to himself or to showing off um, his, his knowledge of, of, of of what's going on on campus and so forth, but um, in fact, Jim, despite his despite his size and his and his and his ability to project himself, he was really um, quite a gentle and humble man. Um, but he he expressed himself loudly and boldly because, um, at least for me, um, he loved Seton Hall. He loved our institution, and he loved the the people that make um, up Seton Hall: the students, the faculty, the uh, administrators. Um, of everyone, really. And he wanted um, Seton Hall to be a truthful institution, um, a place where we witnessed um, to the reality of God's grace um, in, in, in everyday life. So um, in, in that way, I've always thought of Jim as, um, uh, whether or not he thought of him this way, um, himself this way, I, I've always thought of Jim as an evangelist. And um, this annual lecture, um, I think is a wonderful testament to his evangelistic spirit. So um, I hope we at Seton Hall, all of us here um, who are present for this um, annual lecture, um, as well as um, those who could not make it, those out there who, um, who may be um, laboring um, every day um, on behalf of Seton Hall, that I hope we, all of us together, we are making um, Jim proud on a daily basis. Um, so, um, thank you, um, Dr. Murzaku. Um, um, welcome, everyone. Um, I think um, you're in for a terrific um, treat in honor of, of Jim. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Choi, for this wonderful words for our dear friend and colleague. And uh, he was, uh, Monsignor Caffone was bigger than life, you know. He was this big man with a wonderful voice that could he, you know, he could sing. He had a beautiful voice, Monsignor. He loved opera. He loved he loved to teach. You know, uh, he loved, and of course he loved Italy. And uh, I remember when I was hired, actually, as a very uh, you know junior faculty member, it was Monsignor Caffone that immediately you know took me under his wing, and uh, and he always told me, I, uh, you know, just call me father, call me father, call me father. He didn't want, you know, the titles. He was just the priest, the evangelist, as, uh, as Dr. Choi said. So it's wonderful, really wonderful to, to remember uh, Monsignor uh, Caffon uh, yearly. So now I will invite our, uh, I'll, I'll give a, 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 some uh, a background, you know, of our uh, beloved, uh, of, speaker here, uh, Dr. Luan Zurlo. And I have to say uh, that it was Monsignor Coleman actually that uh, had read the book, uh, Luan's book and said, you know, Inez, this is this wonderful book. And I know that Monsignor Caffone would love the book. And then, you know, thing happened for, uh, things happened for, the, uh, for a reason. I knew Luan through a list. So here we have this wonderful speaker today. So Dr. Luan Zurlo is the executive director of the Barilla School Network. Prior to joining the Seton team, so another connection here, in January 2018, Luan taught courses at the Catholic University of America in finance, Catholic social teaching, and education reform in developing countries. Luan spent much of her early career working with Latin America as a ranked Wall Street equity analyst. After experiencing 9-11 firsthand, Luan left Goldman Sachs to found and direct a nonprofit organization, World Fund, whose mission is to raise educational equality in Latin America 
with a special focus on Brazil and Mexico. Luan has lived, traveled, and worked extensively in Latin America and Europe. Right out of graduate school, she taught elementary and middle school children at Colegio de la Asuncion in Ponferrada in Spain. Luan has an MBA in finance and accounting from Columbia Business School, a Master of Arts in International Affairs from, John, from Johns Hopkins University, and a Bachelor of Arts in History from Dartmouth College. She spent a sabbatical studying theology at the Dominican Angelicum in Rome, Italy, and wrote the book. Uh, actually, she wrote uh, two books, but the book that, uh, that she is going to discuss with us today is Pizzas, Popes, and Pasta, Notes from Rome, Sojourn. So with this, I give the floor now to our distinguished guest, Luan Zurlo. Well, thank you, Inez. Um, you're one of the few people that pronounces Ponferrada, Spain perfectly, better than I do. So <laughs> congratulations, I'm impressed. Um, so I'm, I'm really honored to speak at this memorial lecture um, on behalf of Monsignor Cafone. And um, I've tried to learn as much as I could before this evening, because sadly, I'd never met him personally. Um, and it, it he strikes me as many of the adjectives used here, just larger than life. And someone most importantly that clearly lived his Catholicism with great joy. Um, and I think that's, that's not all too common sometimes today. So reading about the Seton Hall's Catholic study program, I came across this descriptive sentence, quote, combining the study of history, philosophy, theology, literature, art, sociology, and other disciplines, Catholic studies focuses on the church's dialogue with culture and encounter with the world, unquote. Well, this describes well, I think, what I'll speak about a bit this evening, a little bit of history, theology, art, and for that other discipline, food. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, just have some background slides for, can, can you all see this? Okay, for when, when some, to make it a little more interesting. So um, as I'm sure most of you know, Seton Hall University was founded in 1856 by the nephew of Elizabeth Ann Seton, who died 35 years earlier in 1821, so 200 years ago. So I work for Seton Education Partners where I lead this Bronx-based network of classically inspired charter schools that place a heavy emphasis on character formation. Um, and then after school, we have a voluntary faith, Catholic faith formation every day after school. So we have about 40 missionaries named Seton Teaching Fellows who work at our schools during the day and teach in our after school program. So, I've come to want to get to know a little bit about this saint who I knew nothing much about. Um, and I've learned that there's a few interesting parallels between her experiences in Italy and my own. She made her well-known voyage to the port city of Livorno, Italy in late autumn of 1803, exactly 110 years before my autumn trip in 2015. Elizabeth Ann Seton stayed for four months, as did I, the saint was deeply touched by the beauty and truths of the Catholic faith while in Italy, as was I. But the similarities end there. Her voyage to Italy took a month on a ship. And when she and her sickly husband and one of her five children arrived, they were forced to quarantine for almost 30 days in a cold stone cell on an island in the Liverno Bay for another month. This was in November and December. She and her husband, who died only a few days after completing quarantine soon after Christmas, came to Italy partly for his health and partly to spend time with his business partners, the generous, deeply Catholic Felici family. The Felici family played a critical role in St. Elizabeth Ann Seton's conversion to the Catholic faith, but it was Elizabeth's experience of the real presence of Christ during the sacrifice of the Holy Mass 
and the reverence of the simple churchgoers in Livorno and Florence that most impacted her, leading to her conversion. Unlike Elizabeth Ann Seton, my greatest hardship in Italy was climbing the 73 steps to my rented apartment each day but especially on that first ascent with three suitcases half filled with books. Incidentally, I replaced the books with Italian shoes on my return trip home four months later. Throughout my remarks, I'm gonna read through some passages of the book I wrote to describe my experiences. So I'm gonna kind of go back and forth. So why did I take a four month sabbatical in Italy? 20 years of intense travel, heavy work, um, it all led me to make the decision that I needed to step back and take an extended break from what had become a, a, a great grind for me. Long fascinated by theology, but I've never formally studied it. In fact, my Catholic education, um, the catechism, frankly, was quite weak. Um, so I decided to structure my Rome sojourn around a couple theology courses I arranged to audit at the Angelicum, which as most of you probably know is a pontifical university in Rome by the order of preachers, God's precocious dogs, as I like to think of them, the Dominicans. Registration for the fall semester was held during the last week of September. So that's when I decided to arrive. My address is Via della Scala 17 a 25 minute walk to both the Vatican and to the Angelicum located just north of the Roman Forum. Now I'm gonna quote from my book. One of the best things about touring blind, just following one's nose and not reading ahead about what one is about to see is being, is being totally surprised by something that touches your senses without any forewarning or expectation. This past Monday, I decided to explore my new Trastevere neighborhood by just wandering the streets. I came across Chiesa di San Francesco d'Assisi a Ripa, where St. Francis of Assisi is said to have spent time. Here, one can view the rock that he actually used as his pillow. Tomorrow, October 4th, is the feast day of St. Francis, a major holiday in Italy, as St. Francis is one of Italy's two patron saints. This church, San Francesco d'Assisi, is nondescript relative to most Roman standards, but then unexpectedly, discreetly situated in a side chapel to the left of the main altar, I came upon one of Bernini's last works, a statue of Beata Ludovica Albertoni. Incredible. I was blown away and knew this must be a major work, but the lighting was poor and the description plate difficult to read so it wasn't until I arrived home and looked up that I discovered that this was a Bernini statue finished in 1674 when the artist was 75 years old. Blessed Ludovica was a noble woman who lived in the mid 16th century and following the death of her husband, while she was in her 30s, she became a third order Francis Franciscan at this very church. And she's buried, this is a funeral, um, um, monument which captures the moment of her death. By the way, Bernini is much more known for his ecstasy of St. Teresa, which he crafted 20 years earlier, which is somewhat similar. A few days later, I took the metro to Piazza del Popolo and decided to make a visit to Santa Maria del Popolo, home to two major Caravaggio paintings the conversion on the way to Damascus and crucifixion of St. Peter. I love Caravaggio and I hope to see as many of his paintings in Rome as I can during his visit. Now the church, um, Santa Maria del Popolo is the indescript church kind of um, to the right of the obelisk. You can see the rounded dome at the top, very indescript church from the outside. Um, and on the right is, is a rendition of the painting which um, which is extraordinary. Finding the major works of art in Rome can be an art unto itself, I found. The harder it is to find, the more you will appreciate it, seems to be the animating theme behind the signage in Rome. I finally found the chapel where the two Caravaggios are hung in almost complete darkness on 
two less visible sidewalls. I plopped a euro in the lighting machine and nothing. The lighting mechanism did not work. Arg. I took a deep breath and turned and walked out knowing I could and would come back. Interesting fact I learned about Caravaggio is that he actually painted two versions of St. Paul's conversion. Um, one being the one housed here and another one lesser known housed in a, another collection in Rome. It's not entirely clear why the second painting for Santa Maria del Popolo, this church was commissioned right after the first one, possibly even by the same Cardinal. From studying the two versions, I like this one better. It feels more powerful and true to life. Here's a guy who just experienced something miraculous, yet personal. And the horse and companion in the front of the horse, which he's a little bit dark, but if you can see the, the gentleman in the front of the horse, they're kind of acting or depicting as if ho-hum, nothing out of the ordinary here, which often I find is the case. Something in life can greatly impact you, but it leaves some others untouched. So my lingering moral dilemma, must I get my bus ticket validated when the bus is so crowded that I can't get near the validating machine? I was feeling okay not doing so until witnessing Numerous American tourists go to great lengths moving through the crowds to have their tickets validated. An impressive show of honesty. I've yet to see a single Italian validate a ticket on a bus. This past week, I made great strides on the path to becoming Roman. I stopped carrying the ubiquitous tourist badge of honor, La Pianta, the map. Rome is not an easy to navigate city. And unlike Renaissance architects, Roman city planners had an aversion to per perpendicular angles. The most impressive test of being Roman is crossing the major arteries that merge into Piazza Venezia, which we see here in front of us, in front of the white wedding cake Victoria Emanuele Due monument, which is that big white one, which is what the photo is taken from next to the Roman Forum. This is a major road convergence point and one I have to pass three days a week on my way to class. Rules and how they were enforced in Italy require a dissertation unto itself. And I'm sure many have written, been written about this. From what I observe, the expression possession is nine tenths of the law most succinctly describes how traffic laws are enforced in Rome. As hard as it is to believe, Rome is a pedestrian friendly city with hashed crosswalks everywhere. Cars, massive tour buses, motorcycles, Vespas are all required by law to stop for pedestrians and crosswalks. As a little bitty itty single pedestrian placing, facing mobs of vehicular traffic speeding by, it is hard to imagine that one really has the right of way. Traffic will not yield to tentative pedestrians, however. Drivers will only yield to courageous pedestrians willing to foist themselves into oncoming traffic with a purposeful forward look and an I own this road attitude. Incredibly, it works. Until last week, I couldn't muster this attitude, so I would wait for savvy Italians to begin crossing and discreetly follow closely on their heels. I came by some Caraggio, this week, and incredibly, when I stepped out purposefully, not looking either right or left, all traffic stopped in both directions. I seriously felt like the opening of the Red Sea for Moses. I now look with empathy upon tourists at crosswalks waiting for the non-existent green light. The Roman Catholic Church definitely has something over the Italian government when it comes to moving crowds and making accessible her treasures. So this is a photo, obviously, of St. Peter's. Um, this was a mercy, taken on Mercy Sunday, actually. Um, right on the dot at 1.45 when I went to, to um, participate in a Scavi tour, the Scavi are the tombs buried underneath St. Peter's. Um, 
there's much to say about the scavi and they're extraordinary. You have to make an appointment well ahead of time, but it is well worth the visit. So a few memorable notes from that visit. The present day St. Peter's Basilica, the construction began in 1506 and took over 100 years to complete. complete. This is the second basilica built on this site. In the fourth century, Emperor Constantine built the first basilica on a hill that served as a burial ground for both pagans and Christians. At the foot of this hill, which we're looking at here, St. Peter's Square now stands. And there was a Roman circus in the middle of which was erected this large obelisk that stands there today, which we can see on the right. St. Peter was crucified upside down in this square in, 1640, in 64 AD possibly looking at this very same obelisk. Early Christian faithful buried St. Peter's bones in this hill above the circus in a vaguely marked spot so as to protect the sacred bones during an era of brutal persecution under Nero. The main altar of the basilica is located directly above the place where St. Peter's bones, wrapped in a cloth and placed in a simple box were believed to have been buried. In recent years, scientific discovery has verified this long-held belief regarding the location of the bones. Pope Pius XII, a man who had a great appreciation for archeology, span sanctioned five renowned archeologists to secretly work under St. Peter's Basilica for 10 years from the late 1930s through World War II. Can you imagine a secret dig under St. Peter's in the middle of one of the most brutal wars in history. The archeologists discovered a number of Christian burial sites, but they are spots, but they could not identify the particular bones of St. Peter with any certainty. In 1953, Italian archeologist Margherita Guarducci identified the burial box containing St. Peter's bones which had seek, been secretly moved in 1942 by a Monsignor ignorant of archeological practices. He did that for safekeeping. In 1968, St. Pope, Pope Paul VI announced to the world that with great certainty, they had found St. Peter's bones and they truly were directly under the main altar, the Balkini. It was, it's just extraordinary. Visiting the Scavi evoked similar thoughts as did a tour I made of the Holy Land some years back. These experiences have made me truly appreciate the corporeality of the Catholic faith. Ours is not purely an abstract or ethereal religion. It's rooted in history, human lives, and sacraments involving physical substances. We can literally and reverently touch physical articles of our faith such as bones of heroic witnesses, the saints and other in their physical dwellings. One of the most venerated places on earth is the Holy Sepulcher, where Jesus was laid for three days after his crucifixion almost 2000 years ago in Jerusalem. One can crouch into the small pit space and touch the actual marble top on which Jesus laid. Visiting, touching and venerating tangible relics of Christianity can inspire more frequent, confident, and focused prayer. It has mine. At mass during the consecration, I envision the cenacle where the last supper took place. While praying the rosary, I can place myself in the actual spot where Jesus was born or baptized or crucified. This helps keep the mind from wandering and opens one up to lights from the Holy Spirit. Praying in front of St. Peter's bones under the high altar of St. Peter's Basilica made me appreciate how reverently and diligently faithful Catholic Christians over millennia have kept watch over the first Holy Father's precious remains. Their reverence and deep faith is a powerful model for us today. My Roman sojourn was extraordinarily special, largely because of two classes I audited at the Angelicum, which was fo is formally named Pontificia Universitas San Tommaso d'Aquino. 
I don't exaggerate when I say that my normally restless mind did not wander for a single moment during these four hours of class lectures I attended each week. So what is a pontifical university? According to the Holy See, pontifical universities are academic institutes established by and directly under the authority of the Holy See, composed of three main ecclesiastical faculties, theology, philosophy, and canon law, and at least one other faculty. These academic institutes deal specifically with Christian revelation and related dis disciplines and the church's mission of spreading the gospel. So there are about 65 pontifical universities throughout the world and 19 of them in Latin America, seven in the United States, including Catholic University of America. Um, and so the roots of the angelicum and these photos here, this is on the left, the, the, the church, the chapel go up that you go up this little hill and then um, to the right is this arcaded kind of square of classes. The roots of the Angelicum stretch way back to 1222 when the first Dominicans established their house of studies in Rome. Aside from St. Dominic himself, the most prominent member of the order is St. Thomas Aquinas who died in, in 1274. Um, I felt, I, I sent this dispatch. So throughout my, my time, my four months in Rome, I sent what I call dispatches. I sent these lengthy emails back to my friends and family in the United States describing my experiences. So um, in all, there were about 14, 15 of them. And then subsequently, when I got home, I was encouraged to publish them. So that's what led to this book. So I waited to the very end to write about my experiences at the Angelicum. Um, and I sent out that dispatch on January 28th, the um, feast day of St. Thomas, who is referred to as the angelic doctor because according to um, St. Benedict the 16th, the title expresses quote, the sublimity of his thought and the purity of his life. So now we know why the university is called the Angelicum. So one of the bragging rights of the Angelicum is the fact that they educated um, one of the greatest of all popes, um, Pope St. John Paul II. He attended the Angelicum right after World War II and wrote his thesis, The Question of Faith According to St. John of the Cross under the renowned Thomist um, Father Gary Gou Lagrange. The story that most touched my heart about St. John Paul II's Angelicum tenure was how he used to serendipitously pick and savor oranges from the trees that filled the garden behind the classrooms surrounding the center courtyard. So um, here's the center courtyard on the right. And if you go out one of, it could have been, that could be that one right here on the left. If you go out there, there's a little garden with some orange trees. Um, having spent a winter myself in Eastern Europe during the communist era, I remember how dearly rare citrus fruit was cherished. So I could completely appreciate his, his sneaking of oranges. So right at 10.30 a.m. on the dot, um, my first professor, I had two classes. One was with the papal theologian, Father Wojciech Giertek, and the other with um, a poet Dominican, Father Paul Murray, who um, also served as a, a part, a partly a spiritual director to Mother Teresa. So right at 10.30 a.m. on the dot, Father Giertek entered the room donning his white Dominican habit determinedly placed his lecture notes on the podium and led us in the recitation of the Our Father, the Hail Mary, in an invocation to St. Thomas Aquinas. Depending on the feast day, other saints would be evoked throughout the semester. Without further ado, he started his lecture. No introduction, no, let me explain how this course works, prelude, just right to the material. I'd never had that any time. And we, we remember as you know, normally you spend a half of your first class explaining everything. And there's so many questions. It, literally, he just started lecturing with no intro. We didn't even know if we'd have to buy a book or not. Um, so Father Murray's class met the next day, Wednesday in the same tired lecture hall as Father Geertek's class. Um, 
Whereas Father Geertek was habitually earlier, right, right on time, Father Murray conveyed a slightly more relaxed attitude towards punctuality. He entered the class on the first day, like most days, with a shy, endearing smile, carrying a pile of books, which he set on the, set on the table before reciting a prayer. He, he himself did give an introduction and um, was a bit more accessible, but no less profound. So Father, um, pa Father Murray, he's a poet. He has a melodious Irish accented voice. Um, if anyone's interested, a great book he wrote, Aquinas at Prayer, which you can actually listen to him reciting it <clears throat> through the audible version. <clears throat> so though, though Dominican, he has a profound understanding and sensitivity to Carmelite spirituality, as does Father Geertek. He's written many books on prayer and contemplation, in addition to books on poetry. He also served as, as I just mentioned, a periodic um, spiritual director for Mother Teresa. So Father Geertek's class had largely priests um, from all over the world. It was, it was, it was I'd say 90% priests. Father Murray's class had more had nuns and more lay people um, to them. This is a painting, um, a Baroque painting in the um, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. It's the beautiful church right near the Pantheon, right behind the Pantheon. It was built over a pagan temple, Minerva. Um, so Santa Maria Sopra over on top of Minerva. And in it is the tomb of St. Catherine of Siena. And to the left, she, her tomb is in the main altar. To the left of the main altar is this side altar um, um, for St. Saint, Saint Thomas Aquinas altar. And this church is managed or run by the Dominicans. And what I found fascinating about this painting is St. Thomas Aquinas is in the middle and he's flanked by these three women, the Blessed Mother on top, Mary Magdalene on the right, and St. Catherine of Alexandria on the left. So St. Catherine of Alexandria and Mary Magdalene are two are the two main patronesses of the Dominicans, which is just a beautiful idea because um, as we probably, many of us know, Catherine of Alexandria is one of the most brilliant, she was brilliant, um, saint and she was able to out discuss out argue if you will all the top minds of alexandria and actually was kind of was was martyred for it more or less and mary magdalene was the preacher of the preachers um who obviously christ presented himself to first so i think they're they both are such appropriate patronesses for the dominicans So in search of our family saint, I set out Saturday morning for Otranto where Capitano Francesco Zurlo, an antecedent of our family, according to my father's genealogy work, was martyred on August 14th, 1480. Otranto is a walled town on the easternmost tip of the Italian boot heel. <laughs> Inez, you're gonna love this. One can actually see Albania though not Russia, from the shore of Otranto. The trip from Rome to Otranto via Lecce entailed trains, buses, walking, and many inquiries extended to skeptical Italians who doubted the feasibility of a round trip trip to Otranto in a New Yorker's time frame. Otranto's history extends back to BC times, largely because of, because of its strategic location. Only in Spain have I myself seen the walls of an ancient town in such great shape. However, the great walls were not able to thwart the Turks from overtaking the strategically important town in 1480. On July 28th, Mehmed II sent Gedik Ahmed Pasha and 18,000 Turkish soldiers to conquer Brindisi, but the winds blew them off course and they landed near Otranto. The hope was to establish a southern foothold for the Turks' European expansion. The 6,000 citizens of Otranto and the soldiers of King Alfonso of Aragon, led by Francesco Zurlo, 
held off the Turks for 15 days until August 12th, when the Turks were able to break through the city walls. According to the pamphlet I picked up at the Basilica of Otranto, Captains Francesco Zurlo and John Antonio Delli Falcone fell heroically while trying to contain the enemy attack. According to, according to my father, Capitano Francesco Zurlo was cut in half at the stomach. Two days after the Turks killed Zurlo and Falcone on August 14th, they rounded up 800 men of Otranto over the age of 15 and ordered them to renounce their Christian faith and convert to Islam. Led by the tailor Antonio Primaldo, they all refused and were beheaded on the Colle della Minerva, now called the Hill of Martyrs. Legend has it that Primaldo was the first to be beheaded and that his body, though headless, remained standing throughout the entire slaughter. 13 months after this slaughter, King Alfonso retook Otranto, gathered up the 800 bodies, which were left unburied on the hill and had 560 of them placed in the Otranto Basilica. So this on the right is the photo of the main altar of the Basilica and behind these three glass plates, um, those are all head skulls. So there are 560 head skulls embedded in this Basilica. Um, the other 240 were incidentally brought to Naples where they're now venerated in a church called Chiesa di Santa Caterina Formigliello. The Otranto Basilica built in the 11th century is also famous for its remarkably preserved floor mosaic portraying the history of man from the fall of Adam to the resurrection. It's interesting because there were these art, art historians there when I visited, they were very focused on the floor because um, it is, I guess, just a major, major, um, major piece of art, um, while I was more focused on the skulls. On October 5th, 1980, Pope John Paul II visited Otranto to celebrate mass on the 500th anniversary of the martyrdom. The 800 were beatified by Pope Clement XIV back in 1771. And then 21, on- 20, 19, 18, 17. Then um, on 2000, in 2007, Pope Benedict XVI issued um, a decree. That's I think we do. We have some voices in the background. Um, issued a decree stating that they were killed out of hatred for our faith. Officially designated them as martyrs, and then Pope Francis. In May of 2013, it was his first canonization. He canonized the 800 martyrs of Otranto and including in, in the group, Francesco Zurlo. So um, it, was a, it was a touching visit. Um, and this was just one of the streets. I took a photo of the sign. Now on to Naples. Um, my first impression of Naples, and this is where the Zurlo family comes from, um, was not the greatest, truth be told. I, we arrived in pouring rain with no one on these gritty streets. Um, it was kind of gray and ugly. And as a result, we decided to go right to the Museo Archeologico Nazionale, the Archeological Museum of Naples, which is famous. It's the probably one of, the, well, it's probably the best collection of Greek sculptures outside of um, outside of Egypt and and um, and Greece. Just extraordinary, um, and um, it also houses um, the main collection of of the um, mosaics from Pompeii. So the museum was frayed, poorly organized, poorly signed, with a meager few security guards watching over literally one of the most important ancient sculpture collections in the world. Um, I could go on with my impressions of dismay. It seemed in my mind to reflect the decline of parts of the city and like the city, it screamed of past glory. For those who do not know Neapolitan history, Naples used to be one of the most important cities in the world, strategically, politically, and artistically, saying nothing of its immense wealth. For millennia, starting with the ancient Greeks, if not even before, 
Naples was a coveted second home destination for the rich and powerful, kind of like the Hamptons, but with impeccable taste. Its history, culture, and local dialect are strongly impacted by Greek, Spanish, and French influences. I won't begin to try to explain why Naples fell off the, its pedestal, um, effects of Italian unification, epidemics, wars, um, but at moments it really felt like um, other places I'd visit, Salvador in the Brazilian state of Bahia, if anyone's been to Salvador, um, Buenos Aires, um, or Havana, Cuba. I mean, these were extraordinary cities that are um, once fantastically beautiful and now ravished kind of by age, neglect, poverty. So my first impression of Naples was definitely third world, but then I gradually came to love it. Um, during the next day, touring Naples in the sun, including upscale neighborhoods overlooking the spectacular Bay of Naples with crowds of Neapolitans strolling not scurrying like they do in New York City, the streets, I was reminded of the French and Italian Riviera. Not all of Naples past glory has been lost. In terms of topography, there's a great similarity between Naples and Rio de Janeiro. It's a fascinating, multi-layered, earthy, gritty, and beautiful and not obvious and not always an obvious way city. Kind of like that French expression, Jolie led beautifully ugly. Um, it struck me as the anti-Gnostic city par excellence. It is no accident that the creche or the Presepi in Italian, first created by St. Francis of Assisi, was popularized in Naples starting in the 16th century. Um, the 18th Bourbon Spanish King Charles III, who was ruling Naples at the time, he had a special fondness for the elaborate nativity scenes, which increased their popularity. And so now virtually in any church you visit um, in Naples, you'll see these huge elaborate Persepes. So Neapolitan guidebooks place a lot of emphasis on pizza invented in Naples and indeed, pizza is an integral part of this city. My parents and I ate our first pizza at a restaurant near the, the one in Na Naples, I mean, the, the real pizza, um, near the archeological museum, which was relatively quiet on that first rainy day we were there. The next day, virtually every pizza place we walked by was packed with Neapolitans trying to get in to place an order. Our second pizza of our trip was particularly special because we ate it at Casa Zurlo, the home of second and third cousins descendant from my great grandfather. One of our Zurlo relatives, a doctor specializing in internal medicine, insisted with all the passion a Neapolitan can muster that the family ate pizza daily because it was the perfect food containing all four food groups. Dinner culminated in dance and karaoke-like renditions with electric piano words on this video screen of O Sole Mio Volare and a third Neapolitan song I can't remember. It became obvious seeing the Neapolitan Zorlos that we are blessed with a no gray hair dream. My father's two second cousins who sat on the couch next to my mom here are close to 90 years old here. And it looks like a love of dogs runs in the family as well. So um, these are here. So they, I mean, these are the first time we met them and we visited their home. And then on the left is us, literally everyone gets their own pizza, um, but they're, they're much thinner than we're used to. So I, um, I could recount some more stories and I would be happy to, but why don't I end my remarks here and perhaps if um, open it up to questions or if, um, you have any other questions I can, as I say, recount more stories. You know, my hope here is that um, the book and my remarks might surge, serve kind of as a nudge of encouragement um, to act on risky, perhaps, inspirations from the Holy Spirit. Um, God gives much to those who follow him with abandon. Um, if nothing else, may these words provide a bit of joy and insight into an extraordinary city at the heart of Jesus Christ's precious gift to the world, the Catholic Church. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Luan. This was beautiful. And uh, I know that many in our audiences, they want to go very badly to, to, to Italy, you know, to visit Italy. So thank you so much for this uh, remarks and the be a beautiful presentation. So uh, now we'll open this to questions or comments uh, from, uh, from the audience. Uh, just raise your hands, or you can you can also use the the uh, uh, the chat, because of course we cannot uh, take all the questions. Any questions? I don't see everybody because we have forty six participants here, but. Uh, I, this is Gloria. I do not have yes, a question. <clears throat> Hello. I do not have a question. I just have a congratulations. It's a lovely presentation and um, brings us back virtually, if nothing else. Uh, we cannot be there, but thank you. It was very nice and very moving. And what a wonderful way to meet uh, a branch of the family that you did not know. A wonderful place. So thank you very much for the presentation and for the uh, remarks that, you know, that were part of like, uh, not prepare, but it were part of your um, communications with your family and friends far away. So thanks again. Thank you, Gloria. Gloria and I spent time, we, we went to Cuba together when Pope Benedict the 16th in the spring Easter time of 2012 did a, we were able to go there under a formal, you know, a formal plan and it was extraordinary. So it's good to see you again, Gloria. I saw, John, yeah, I saw oh. John Zurlo here, but with uh, with the Siena shirt. They, they, they do not go together, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, John? That's my uncle. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Gloria, you're, did you're I on mute, you? Uncle Johnny. But, but we also see a Zurlo with a nice glass of red wine, too, enjoying the lecture. <laughs> That's oh, my dad. Okay. Yes, uh, he's Eugene. Yes, Chin Chin Eugene. Salute. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes. yes. Other... Right? Madam Director? Yes, please. Yes, Ms. Zurlo, a great presentation on Rome, and you didn't forget to remind us that there's culture in Southern Italy. Very nice. And another great thing you did, that you came from the financial world and you came into the Catholic world. A great example for the young people listening. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, other questions or remarks or comments? Well, I can ask one thing to Luan. Uh, hi, Luan. It was great the, to see you and your and your family and everything and everyone. But my question will be: what, what do you think are the three most amazing things that you learn? Even though, I mean, as as the the Dr. Anthony that says you are not. Um, I mean, you are from finance. So, what do you think are the three main things that you can say these two things or these three things or this one thing is something that really changed? the way I see the life in general, my life in general. From, from the trip to Italy? Yeah, I know there's so many. I mean, I know that for you, I mean, four months in this spectacular place with this experience is great, but in your personal life, like what, what can you say that is one thing that really changed your life after four months in Italy? Well, first, maybe it's a little mundane, but it makes you slow down. Um, you know, it makes you, it makes you kind of smell the roses. You know, one experience, I, I, I love opera and I, I went to Milan a couple times on business trips and literally right behind La Scala, it's, it's the, it's a really the beautiful downtown right near the, the main cathedral. And, um, there's some finance offices right there, some beautiful streets. And I went to um, to go to an opera, I was given a ticket and um, I was walking around the area and I'm like, oh my goodness, I've been here before. I would go to these business meetings in this office, literally across the street from La Scala. And I think I had no idea. I would just go in, do my meetings, go back to the airport, you know, everything was fast, fast, fast. And I thought, boy, what a different, it was like, 
going to a different place because it was just a different mindset. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, the, well, this isn't maybe, it, it, it's kind of a little bit off the track, but the, it, things are so beautiful in Italy. The churches are extraordinary. I mean, the art, the, the, the art is just, it's just, it's just teeming with it. And yet, generally speaking, the churches are relatively empty. I mean, there are exceptions without a doubt. And so it was like, it was kind of, you know, it makes the churches a little bit and literally in Florence, they are museums. You literally have to, unless you can kind of show that you're going there to pray, you have to pay an admission to get into some of the major churches in downtown Florence now. And um, whereas in the US, frankly, you know, there, I'm just going to say it. I think there are a lot of ugly churches. There's some beautiful churches, but you know, there was, there are some not so pretty churches, frankly. And yet our faith has remained much generally speaking. And I know it's, you know, I know it's declining, but generally speaking, Americans have really held on to their faith. And you go, even like in New York city, you go to mass on Sunday and they're packed. Like you masses, you know, and coronavirus obviously is, we're in a new reality, but I just thought that was an interesting juxtaposition. You've got such richness on one side, aesthetically at least, um, but people just seem, a lot of people kind of take it for granted. Um, and we don't have such richness in that area here, but yet we've held on to our faith. So it's kind of shows it, it's, it's, it's much deeper than that. As Elis reading about Elizabeth Ann Seton, it was, yeah, the art was impressive to her, but it was really, it was at the moment of consecration and seeing the simple people kneeling um, in such veneration, that's what brought her to the Catholic faith. Excellent point. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Luann. Um, I think that we came to, to the end of this wonderful program. And uh, I'll thank you again, Luann, for this uh, great lecture. And uh, I know that many of our audience here, you know, they want to return to, to Rome or go to Rome for, or, or, or Italy for that matter, you know, and, and discover their roots. This is a beautiful story about the Zurlo. I have read a lot about the Otranto, uh, you know, martyrs, but I didn't know this connection. So thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, may I ask Monsignor Coleman to say uh, the prayer, the ending prayer, Monsignor? Yes, thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. I just want to say uh, thank you, Luann. It was wonderful. And I think that uh, our dear friend Monsignor Cafone would appreciate uh, so many of the things you spoke about because uh, there was no way in his life where he separated love of God from love of people and, and the wonderful surroundings, the, the creation, that, that, that especially in the artistic world, that uh, came about because of people's uh, love of God and, and love of beauty. So thank you for putting them all together. Uh, I think you would have deeply appreciated that. Thank you so much. And we know that when we gather in the Lord's name, he's in our midst. And so let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, look kindly upon all of us, especially in these difficult days. Let your love shine forth in the darkness and help us so that we can know and do your will with joy and gladness. Pour out abundant blessings upon Seton Hall University and help us to remain ever faithful to our mission. Speak and to teach the truth. Who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Monsignor Coleman. And thank you everybody for coming and attending this wonderful lecture. And I really want to see more of you in our wonderful events uh, of uh, Seton Hall University Catholic Studies. And the recording will be available and we'll post it on our uh, webpage. Thank you again, everybody. And hope to see you soon. Okay. Thank and Luan, you. to bye be bye. continued. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank bye. you very much. Bye. Thank you.